and we want to know for which ones the construction is secure. And this function could be reduction mod p, but could, for example, be simple bit truncation that keeps the first r bits of the state. And we also study a related and simpler to analyze construction, which we call the augmented cascade construction, uh, which is different in that the keying proceeds through the initialization value and not through prepending to the message. And in fact, in this talk, I'm going to focus on augmented cascades. You have to trust me that it's quite easy to get a bound on H a Mac uh, generically or almost generically giving a bound on augmented cascades. So in fact, in the, in, in, the, in the paper, so our analysis consists of two ingredients that I'm going to talk about next. So the first one is actually a standard model reduction that reduces the multi-user security of the augmented cascade to a new multi-user PRF assumption on the underlying compression function. And then at the end to get some numbers and compare it, since it's a new assumption, to compare it with new construction, we also do an ideal model analysis of this assumption that is gonna give us some concrete numbers. Uh, let me mention in passing here only that we are not the first to analyze this type of constructions, but so far analysis of variants of merkle damgard retruncation have only been studied in the context of indifferentiability. Uh, in particular, the work by Coron et al. that introduced indifferentiability for hash functions analyzed a chopped MD construction, which is a uh, merkle damgard construction with truncation with the goal of getting a keyless hash function. And they prove indifferentiability for it, and it's not too hard to get a bound for PRF security in the ideal model from the differentiability proof pretty generically. But the point is that the bounds that you will get are too weak and do not highlight the key feature that we are gonna obtain through our analysis, direct analysis for PRF security. Okay, so let me start with the more technical contents of this talk, starting with the standard model component uh, of this analysis. So what we, um, so the first thing I wanna do is I wanna like formalize a little bit more our security target. And first recall that the standard PRF security notion uh, requires the construction, in this case, the augmented cascade construction with some output function out to be indistinguishable under a secret key from a truly random function with matching uh, input and output domains. And indistinguishability here is measured by requiring that the PRF advantage is small for all feasible adversaries or distinguishers, A, where the advantage is defined with by the difference of the probabilities that the adversary outputs one on the left and the probability that it outputs one on the right. Now, what we wanna do first is we wanna extend this notion to the multi-user setting, and the standard way of doing so is to consider an a priori unbounded number of instantiations of the construction under independent keys and the distinguisher now can access this arbitrarily and adaptively, for example, by making queries to the first one and then getting an answer and then deciding upon its answer to make a query to another instance and so on and then make a decision. And we want this to be indistinguishable from a setting where all of the instances are replaced by independent random functions. And again, we can define a natural multi-user PRF advantage by comparing the probabilities of outputting one in the two settings. So this is going to be our target. And let me first point out that there's a folklore fact that relates uh, multi-user and single-user security. So the multi-user security can never be more than u times worse than the single-user security in concrete terms, where u is a bound on the number of users or instances the distinguisher decides to make queries to. And this is proven by a standard hybrid argument. And if you go this route, actually, this factor u loss is actually substantial. It can be as large as the number of queries in the worst case. But fortunately, it's not always necessary. And as you will see in this talk, in many cases, it's worthwhile to target proving bounds on multi-user security directly rather than going the hybrid argument route. Okay, so given I specified what the target is, let's look at the assumption. So ideally, we would like to prove our result only assuming that the underlying compression function is a good pseudorandom function. So, or maybe a multi-user pseudorandom function. Now, unfortunately, this is not possible. I'm not gonna make this statement formal, but intuitively, it's enough to look at the following situation. Imagine that the attacker is querying one message and then the extension of that message with an additional block. Then the attacker will find itself in such a situation when he learns two such values. And what we can see is that the lower value intuitively is giving us some partial information about the key value which is used when evaluating f to get the upper value. And you can actually build, depending on the function out, very easily as a little homework exercise, so on PRF f that completely break down in with respect to security when used in this context. So what we actually need to here assume is uh, intuitively is that the compression function f remains a PRF even when you leak information about the underlying key 
uh, using the function out, the outflow function. And this is exactly what we formalized. This is our PRF security notion under out leakage, which does exactly this. So it requires indistinguishability from a random function in a setting where in the real world we are given out of k for the function out and for the extra key. And in the ideal world, we just sample a random independent key and give it to the adversary out of that key, which has nothing to do with the actual system at hand. And we can define a corresponding advantage. And also, I'm not depicting it here, but you can also extend naturally the notion to the multi-user setting by having multiple instances. Note that this is, despite the name, this is much simpler than the traditional notion of leakage resilient PRF, considering the leakage resilience world, because we really have one fixed function, a priori fixed function, under which we get leakage, and that's it. No um, arbitrary polynomial time function or so on. OK. So given this notion, we can come to our first main standard model result, which is a reduction that shows that if the underlying compression function is a multi-user uh, secure PRF under out leakage, then the augmented cascade construction is also a good pseudorandom function for in the multi-user setting. We actually proved this quantitatively, and it's interesting to have a closer look at it. So first of all, what you see is that the bound incurs a loss, a concrete loss, a factor L loss, where L is a bound on the number of blocks in each query made by the uh, distinguisher. Also, another important point is that you can't really get a PRF for any possible out. Clearly, I haven't talked about it, but the properties of the function out matter. So if out is a constant function, how can this be a pseudorandom function? So there is an additional term that characterizes when out is a good function or not, is this delta out which essentially measures how well out preserves uh, random input and produces a random output. This is just a statistical distance of the output on the random input from a random output. Okay? But an important point here of this result conceptually is that we are actually reducing to a multi-user security assumption. Okay? And this will be very worthwhile. We could apply the hybrid argument here and reduce directly to a single user assumption, but you will see that it will be much more worthwhile here to reduce to multi-user security. We're going to get much better bounds in distanciation. Okay? And also note that the bound doesn't depend explicitly on the number of users. And this is something that we do not really know how to do with other constructions. So let me give you like a three minute overview of the proof here. Okay? So the proof really follows standard techniques in this area, I mean at least a standard framework in this area, to model in the interaction between the distinguisher and the construction all of the internal values that have been computed by uh, the augmented cascade construction through a tree, a label tree. So for example, if the distinguisher queries a message consisting of two blocks, M1, M2, we can think of this as defining a path where the root is, the is a node that contains the actual key value. And then when we evaluate on the first message block, we're going to move to another node that contains the state of the cascade after one call to F as its value, and then so on after two calls. And finally, we produce this little node on the side, which is going to contain the actual value you get after applying out to the previous state. And you can go on doing this over multiple queries, and you're going to get a whole tree. And the height of the tree is going to be at most L, which was the bound on the number of blocks in a query. And what we want to show now is that uh, we want to show that the values contained in these little nodes that are actually those given to the distinguisher are pseudo-random. And we can do this by having a simple hybrid argument here, or fairly simple, where we actually replace the value layers after layer first in the first L hybrids by using uh, our multi-user assumption under leakage. And it's essential to have the leakage in order for the reduction to go through, okay? Because you get some values are leaked about the key values in the higher level. And then in the fire hybrid, we just replace the output values with uniform one using the combinatorial assumption on the out function. But at triangle inequality, this gives us a bound on the advantage. Okay. Now, this is great, okay? But the reason we want to move to the ideal model analysis of this is that we want to make a comparison, so without a construction. So now we have this standard model result, but the reduction is to a new assumption on a compression function, which is not validated by cryptanalysis at all. So we don't have good numbers to put in there to start with. I mean, it's a great question, but we don't have them. So instead, what we do in order to have a good comparison, we transfer to the ideal model. And for example, by instantiating the compression function through a public random function or through Davis-Meyer in the ideal cipher model, and on top of this, you know, giving, this is going to give us at least some good value to assess security against generic attackers. And it's going to also allow us to compare the construction in this model with other constructions. So I'm going to focus now on the random compression uh, model here, and random compression function model here. And the question we want to address to instantiate the theorem is how large is this advantage uh, in this model? 
So by this, I really mean we are in a world where we have a public random compression function in the sky that everyone can access, including the adversary, if you're going to use it to instantiate the construction. And in the rest of this talk, in the final minutes of this talk, I'm going to focus just on the case where our output function is very simple. It's just plain truncation that just keeps the first R bits of the state. Yeah? This will make things simpler. So just to make it clear again what I mean by the model, so for the standard PRF security of the compression function, what we will consider is a setting where we choose the compression function uniformly at random and a key, and then the attacker can make queries to the compression function under this key, say so he has a budget of Q queries, and then can make also direct queries to the compression function under both arguments and has a budget QF queries of this before making a decision. And we compare this to a setting where the compression function under the key is replaced by a random function with matching parameters. And it's easy to prove in this setting that the best advantage of an adversary is bounded by QF over two to the C, where C is the size of the, um, yeah, the, of the actual first, uh, second argument. And this is just because as a bound here, you can just take the probability that the distinguisher makes a query, uh, a direct query that contains the secret key as the first argument. And this is very easy to bound this probability and it only depends on QF but not on Q. And that's important, that's a standard argument. Now what happens if we actually have leakage? So if we have out k additionally given to the adversary, then the analysis carries over very naturally. Now the adversary learns r bits of the key but still has uncertainty over the remaining c minus r. So all that happens is that the bound is gonna change in the bound the denominator is going to change to two to the c minus r instead of two to the c. That's a very easy argument. But the interesting things happen when we translate now to the multi-user setting. These are all for the single user setting. And interesting if you are, this is actually becomes really interesting because in the Leak-free case, it turns out that if you want to get a corresponding multi-user bound where the attacker make Q queries distributed over U put, uh, at most U users, so U independent keys, the best you can do really here is apply the hybrid argument. It's essentially tight. So the advantage increases by a factor of U plus there is a U square over two to the C term to account for collision in the keys. So in the worst case, we will expect the same to happen after leakage. So the hybrid argument will be applied and we will get something there and essentially we don't get any benefit in having a multi-user PRF assumption in our theorem. But luckily it turns out that this is not true and maybe somewhat surprisingly, we actually provide an analysis here of the multi-user PRF security of a random compression function under leakage and it turns out that you can heavily beat the hybrid argument here by proving a, a bound directly. And in particular, the security really only mildly decreases once you increase the number of users. So the leading term in our advantage bound is very similar up to a multiplicative factor uh, which is not excessively large to the single user bound. So there's almost no security loss. There is another term which is what by far not being the leading term which is actually the same that we got for the leak free case here. Okay, and this is gonna allow us to instantiate um, this advantage term in our main theorem, in the standard model theorem to get an ideal model um, so and this is tight, I should have mentioned, and this is gonna allow us to instantiate our theorem in the ideal model and get a bound. Now you don't have to read and parse the, all the bound, it's pretty complicated. This is for just bit truncation. But the key point here is that the, if you compare it with an MMAC bound, which is not published anywhere for the same problem, but you can compute it, uh, it's pretty folklore, uh, you will realize that the first term of the bound is, um, is actually uh, pretty similar. So there's no much difference. And the second term, which is actually the leading term, or can be potentially dangerous because it has a much smaller denominator, so it could be larger. But the great thing about this, this is exactly what you wouldn't get by applying the indifferentiability bound directly, is that this term, if you look at the numerator, all terms involving query numbers are linear in the number of queries. So there's a Q and there's a QF. It's divided by two to the C minus R, so it could be potentially larger, but we have no square upstairs. And so in fact, if you are in the setting where, for example, r is smaller than c over two, which is very common, otherwise you will use a smaller hash function to start with, then uh, th there's really no much loss. So, so essentially security is going to hold up to the same security level. And if we go back to our original uh, application, so where we had reduction mod p, that was the case for the signature scheme, um, then we can actually do the same, apply our theorem gener generically and we can get a similar bound that I'm not gonna get into details, but the main message is that everything is fine, okay? So what we, just to wrap up, um, uh, concluding remarks. So this is really, first of all, is a practical implication of this word which provides the, the first uh, validation uh, of the PRF construction which is used uh, inside a very popular signature scheme and that was not validated before. 
And also, overall, the construction really provides a simpler and more efficient alternative uh, to HMAC and NMAC in settings where it can be applied. So for example, where truncation is possible. And it has comparable security uh, to H and NMAC, to HMAC and NMAC in this setting. And I think the other important thing, which is not explicitly in the slides, but that I want to stress out, uh, there is really an interesting conceptual point here, which is that no matter whether you target multi-user, the probably you should, I will argue, or single user security, there is really some value into making a multi-user security assumption instead of a single user one as we're used to, uh, because it really allows us to get potentially sharper uh, numbers for that underlying assumption to get stronger concrete security result. Okay, that's everything I wanted to say. Uh, thank you. So thank you for the talk. And uh, do we have any questions? I can see that we have. There is a microphone coming from the back. Um, so the motivation of all this was the so that in this AdWords, whatever DSA, mm -hmm. um, the R for the randomness gets generated using a PRF right. with a secret key for each user. And yeah. you want that to be tight. No? So that yes. was the motivation. Yes. So couldn't you achieve the same if you just, instead of generating R as PRF of the secret key, could you just add the public key to the, PR, to the PRF input? Then you would probably get a tight security reduction with a normal oh I, I see setting. I see what you mean by tight I mean this is uh, it's different so there's two issues right I mean I don't think with respect to tightness I don't think this will be a problem so if you use a PRF and you do what you what you do it's okay uh, I think tightness you get through many construction I mean this is really about analyzing the actual construction that they use inside and uh, that's motivated by that but I'm not arguing that's the only way you can get tightness so you can do it with any PRF construction and by doing the trick that, that so you the want. trick would be to add the public key to the PRF yeah, so I think you yeah. probably have to do that anyway, so, yeah. But then you don't need uh, a PRF in the multi-user setting, um, right? I mean, the whole thing or the whole idea of analyzing PRF in the multi-user setting is that you have many, many keys, meaning that, that are coming from many users, but if you also hash or if you add the, yeah, I mean the public I key to the, the PRF, you don't have this issue. Right, right, I see your point, but I think it's orthogonal to this, right? I mean, we're just taking the construction out as a motivation and analyzing it and multi-user. It might be that for the specific application, you don't need to do as much if you do it right. I, I agree with you, yeah. We have time for one more short question. Uh, okay, so I don't know, hopefully it's short. So how do you compare this? Uh, I mean, it seems like you're kind of intentionally, or I guess uh, the designers, I mean, you just analyze what somebody suggested, but you're shooting yourself in the foot by just giving for free this kind of uh, part, parts of the key. It seems, so you know, there is this two root n minus c kind of things in the denominator. Wouldn't it just be better to ensure like prefix freeness, for example, uh, or to just have one of the much simpler kind of uh, solutions, right, because we don't have two to the n minus c kind of bound. It's just strange that you lose, save like two hash calls or something like that, but you're like giving up so much. Well, I, I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not really the right person here. Maybe Dan could answer it better, but so from the practical standpoint, this is not the only example where this hasn't been done, right? I mean, you can make the same argument for HMAC, right? So someone could just use directly the cascade construction for prefix-free encodings, and the people just didn't like uh, using prefix-free encodings at all. But from a theoretical standpoint of bounds, yes, you could do prefix-free encodings and you will get the same application. We're really analyzing this concrete construction, uh, which is more efficient, uh, and, and that's it. But yeah, from the perspective of concrete security, you can do plenty of other things. But you know, that construction has been around. That was published in the same year as, uh, as, as HMAC and NMAC, and I don't know if anyone was really using it, right? So, yeah. Okay, so let's take for any further questions offline. Let's thank Stefano again for the talk. And we can now move to the second talk of this session.
to wait a minute for micing the speaker up, and then we can continue. So in the meantime, I, as you can see, the the next talk will be on the on the influence of the message length on the security of TMAC. And the authors of this this paper are Atul Lewix, Bart Fresnel, Alan Shepenetz, and Kanya Suda. And Atul is going to give the talk, and he's just arriving at the stage. Sorry? Uh, it will be, I think, so once we start, yes. Okay. Now? It's good? Okay. Uh, <coughs> so, Stefano, he talked uh, a lot about uh, security bounds in his, uh, in his previous talk, and that was a big thing, uh, theme throughout his, uh, throughout his presentation, and uh, exactly computing what the bounds were for AMAC. And uh, I'm going to continue talking about bounds, so just before I continue, I'm going to step back a bit and look, uh, look at the motivation, why we're so interested in the bounds. Well, so when you're trying to pick parameters for cryptographic schemes, um, the security bounds are one of the most useful tools in, I'm sorry, this is a, just need a bit different presentation. <laughs> there you go. So <laughs> I changed it last minute. So the security bounds are uh, one of the most useful tools we have in determining what parameters we can use and still remain secure. Uh, so the security bounds, they tie in together adversarial resources, the scheme's parameters and what the scheme's properties are. And uh, also, you need to pick a particular confidence level, you know, against what kind of, what's the maximum probability that you want the adversaries to have success. Um, then tying all of these three things together and uh, relative to some assumptions, some reasonable assumptions, then you can make a graph, like I'm showing on the right over there, where the axes represent the adversarial resources, like number of queries or the message length that the adversary can make, and you divide uh, the resources into a kind of a secure zone where you know that if the adversary stays, as in if the adversary is limited to the secure zone, then you'll be fine. But then if you go beyond, then all bets are off. And uh, this is actually, the security bounds are actually used in practice in, well, standards organizations are actually looking at these. So for TLS 1.3, they needed to decide whether to include a key update f uh, function uh, for GCM. Um, based on the bounds computed using, um, using these security bounds from the literature. And in the ISO standardization process, they're now deciding whether a 48-bit block size, is that big enough uh, as a block cipher? Because Simon and Spec, they're going through the standardization process over there, and, uh, and uh, they might uh, standardize a 48-bit block size. And security bounds come into play over there as well. So let's look at a concrete example. EMAC, it's a very well-known uh, PRF. And the way it works is you take your message, you chop it up into blocks, and then you take the first block, you process, process it into a random permutation. In practice, the random permutation is a key block cipher. Then you take the output of the random ter permutation, XOR it with your second plain text block, and you continue like this. The first part over there is what's often called CBC MAC. The last part is uh, another permutation call usually with an independent key, and that's why it's called encrypted CBC MAC or EMAC. Now, the security bounds for EMAC, or let me say the initial security bounds for EMAC, were of this form over here. Uh, ah, there you go. So I'll just walk through what these symbols mean. So Q is the number of queries that the adversary can make. L is the length of the messages that the adversary can make. N is the block size of this um, block cipher or permutation. And then you get this polynomial over here in the adversary's resources and divided by ex um, exponents, I mean, two to the n. And on the right over there, you have your confidence. Okay, so you can actually then compute some numbers using this equation over here. Let's say we, we don't want the adversaries to have success probability more than one in a million. So that's, uh, I just said, one over two to the 20. And let's say that your messages are all gonna be about a kilobyte long. Now, what happens when you plug in AS128, present, or Catan32 into EMAC, uh, each of which have different block, ciphers, block sizes, 128, 64, 32 bits? Well, you can see how many 
queries you can make on the right-hand side over there. For AES, because it has a large block size, you can make 251 queries. With present, it's reduced to 18.5, and with a 32-bit block size, you're restricted to four queries um, that you can make with Emacs before going into the insecure zone. So I'm more of a visual person. Uh, these individual data points are a bit hard to picture. Uh, so what I did was I plotted, plotted this uh, bound over there. Um, so now what's not displayed over here is that I picked a 32-bit block size and I assumed that the confidence le level is set to one in a million. Then here along the horizontal axis, the number of queries that the adversary makes increases and along the vertical axis, the message length. So let's say that you want to resist adversaries, well, let's say that your messages are of, uh, you know, two to the six blocks over here and you want to make two queries, well, then you're already in the insecure zone according to this bound. Um, and like this, you can, you can you know, see what happens with various uh, parameters. So if you're making two to the six queries, then all of a sudden you're straight away right at the edge of the insecure bound. Um, so this is quite a serious restriction with a 32-bit block cipher. So as a result, people have looked at Emac more closely and they've come up with better bounds. Okay. So here you notice that all of a sudden you can make much longer queries. And uh, it's also it's a log-log graph, so things increase exponentially as you go along the vertical axis. Um, and then people continued looking for better bounds. So this was this bound over here is actually better when you look at bigger block sizes, but for due to the constants in the bound, it doesn't turn out to be better in this case. And then, okay, these are still these are all, this is all the research that we have right now in Emac. It's still a serious restriction when you're using a 32-bit block cipher. The question is, okay, could we still just, you know, kind of ignore these and go go beyond these bounds? Um, well, for that we need to look at attacks, and you've got this entire red zone over here, which is the birthday bound. Okay, so there's a Prenel van Orskot attack which shows that you cannot go anywhere over here because then you're in an insecure zone. And then if you look at the papers that computed these bounds, well, they also, you can see that you can find an attack on the message link. So you can't go anywhere up here. So that limits Emac to being used within this first quadrant. Now, the remaining area of the first quadrant, that's still unknown. Uh, but if you do plug in a random function instead of a random permutation into Emac, then this entire zone gets filled in red as well. So now with these limitations of Emac, okay, so then what, what can you do if you're really dead set on using a 32-bit block cipher? What, what are your options? Well, the only thing left to do is uh, to switch schemes. So, well, here for clarity, I wrote down Emac. Now, if you want to go beyond to the right, there are a few schemes which allow you to do that. There's a sum of CBCs, there's a Pmac plus 3KF9. These are all so-called beyond birthday bound constructions. Then, now b besides that they're beyond birthday bound constructions, there are also constructions which allow you to query much longer messages, uh, which are going basically vertically up there. There's PMAC with parity, LightMAC, and PMAC X. Now, the uh, funny thing is I don't know of any constructions which are in this, this quadrant over there, but you can probably use techniques from the other two quadrants to get into that last one. In either case, the focus of this research is understanding this message length over here. What's happening? What are these uh, techniques that are used over here? And um, in particular, if we look at these three constructions, which alleviate this message length restriction, well, they're all a uh, pretty similar style of PRF. There are these so-called XOR style, well, what I'm calling XOR style PRFs. Uh, so the way they work is they take the message, and from the message, they're going to compute a whole bunch of block cipher or permutation inputs. Uh, so I label the x1, x2, x3, x4 because it's not as simple as in Emac where you're just chopping the message into blocks. You're actually chopping it into blocks, then reusing some blocks and multiplying, XORing masks into there. Um, and then what they do is then they, they compute the block, the, the permutation outputs, and XOR all of those guys together. And what I haven't shown here is that then there's going to be an output transform, but that's not so important right now. So this is also completely different from Emacs cascade style. So 
this is uh, this is how they are able to alleviate this message length bound from Emacs. And then uh, notice that two of these constructions have this name uh, Pmac, use this name Pmac in the title. But that's because the way they compute their X values, their block cipher inputs, was inspired by this construction called Pmac, which is short for parallelizable map. Um, so the way Pmac works is, okay, it starts like Emac, it chops your message into message blocks. Then it's going to compute these masks over here. So the masks, they're computed by taking some constant and then multiplying them with some intermediate key. This intermediate key is just computed as the output of the block cipher under zero. So it masks all the block cipher calls, then does the exact same thing of what I dis described over there. Then it PMAC uses, then computes an, uh, um, uses an output transform on this result over here, which I'm calling P hash. Now, um, so the advantage that PMAC has over PMAC with parity and PMAC X is that it's a lot more efficient. So it's actually good, just going to make one block cipher call per message block, whereas PMAC X and PMAC with parity or even LightMAC, they'll do at least two or three uh, block cipher calls per plain text block. Um, okay, also to be clear, and now I've described P hash over here very generically. Okay, so this multiplication is done in some finite field. Uh, and the actual instances, if you actually want to use PMAC, so there are two known instances, one using gray codes, one using power, powering up. And that's just basically picking what these constants over here are. So now you can also ask, okay, what, do, what does a PMAX bounce look like? Because it's, it's used for a lot of these high security extensions. Um, so then, you can see over here that it's you know it's just like Emac basically. It's still in the first quadrant. So you still have with Pmac, you still have this Bio this Bio birthday bound, this Benil and Van Oskar attack. But actually, up until this point, this message length attack this was non-existent. Nobody knew. Um, so then you have all these constructions which are alleviating this message length dependence and which are based on PMAC, but we don't even know if PMAC itself actually provides us with uh, the bounds up there. It's, the question is basically, are PMAC's bounds up there or not? Or is there an attack? So this is a basic research question that we set out to solve, or s at least explore. Um, can PMAC be moved up there? Now, I'll just go now to explain my results. We be actually, in the paper, we actually focus on this p-hash. Now, why do we focus on p-hash? Because finding a collision in p-hash means that you can find a collision in p-mac, which results in an attack on p-mac. Hence, if we can find a collision in p-hash, which increases with the message length, then we'll have our results. So what we concluded, is basically that message length dependence changes according to the mask. Uh, so this is, a, this is quite a stupid statement. It's deceptively simple. Uh, if you forget everything else from the presentation, at least remember this. But what does this mean? Now, over here, I've drawn a big circle, which is supposed to represent all the p-hash instances. So, th th so that means you can change what the finite field is and what the constants are and the masks. So you, have, you have gray codes in there. You've got powering up in there as well. So what we, what we saw was that, well, infinitely many of these cons uh, instances have a collision upper bound of 2 to the n, which means that they're message length independent. Or there's this problem of given an arbitrary p-hash instance, can you generically find a collision with a high probability? And that problem is computationally hard, which is based on a conjecture explained in the paper. So basically, we're in either one of these two settings with PMAC in general. So that's what I mean by it depends on what kind of masks you pick. And then if you look at a concrete instantiation of PMAC, well, we found an attack on PMAC with gray codes, which does exhibit uh, dependence on message length. So if we go back to the picture that I drew earlier on, so this arrow over here 
we basically provided evidence that there are instances of PMAC out there which could be, which could be uh, up with the other uh, constructions over there. But on the other hand, you know, there are instances where it's not the case at all, like with gray codes, where you have measured length extenders, right? But, oh yeah. <laughs> Good, so then perhaps I can just briefly explain some intuition as to why, why this is the case. Okay, I explained the motivation and the results, and now just briefly, what's happening, basically. So, it's useful to compare this p hash with XOR hash. XOR hash is some other construction which is used for light Mac, for XOR Mac, and it's a lot simpler. The way it works is you take your, your message and you divide it into half blocks. The remaining half of the block you use as a counter. So, you're actually sacrificing half of the input of this permutation. Um, for this counter, which means that you're going twice as slow as PMAC, a PHASH over here. So what happens in a collision for XOR hash? Well, a collision for XOR hash means that you basically get this long sequence of block cipher outputs which XOR to zero. Uh, why is that the case? Well, okay, here is, here's one message, here's another message, and you want those two to be equal. Since it's just the uh, XOR of a bunch of blocks or permutation outputs, you can XOR all of them together and then try to figure out if it equals zero. So one thing that we can observe in XOR hash is that if you take this first block cipher input, well then it's never going to equal any of these first other three block cipher inputs because of the counter. Okay. Similarly with the, uh, with the second method. So none of these guys are ever going to collide with, these, with each other because of the separa forced separation due to the counter. And you can also make the same conclusion for you know, the first with these, these message blocks over here. So there's a lot of message blocks which won't collide with each other. Okay. But message blocks that can collide with each other are ones with the same counter. So the first message block over here can collide with this one, second one can collide with that one, but the only way that they can collide is if these half blocks equal each other, which means that they will cancel each other out over here in the XOR. But now even if there's M1, M2, M3, and M1 prime, M2 prime, M3 prime, even if they're exactly the same, there will still be one block sorry for output XORs into here, which means that your collision is very unlikely to happen because the probability that this guy equals zero is very low. So XOR hash removes this dependence on message length by actually forcing these block cipher in the, uh, inputs to be quite different. Uh, so obviously this, you can't do this with phash because there's no forcing of uh, explicitly forcing of the block cipher puts to in be independent. You have to kind of make sure that they're distinct from each other uh, using this masking here and the secret value. Um, now if you use a naive approach, you can just say, okay, you can try to bound the probability that any pair of block cipher inputs doesn't collide, which means that you then get L over two, L over choose two probable, uh, um, possible collisions, and as long as you don't have any collisions, you won't have an XOR to zero. Um, but then you get a really bad bound. You get a bound that's dependent on the message length. So, uh, but then an observation that's already been made, actually, is that, okay, you can do better than that. Let's say that this guy collides with this guy, and this guy collides with this guy, which means that these two will cancel out and these two will cancel out. And let's say that this group of three over here, they all collide with each other. Two of them will cancel out, but still one of them will, will remain, which means that you have at least one block cipher output, and hence you have a very low probability that it that output will equal zero. And so what's so the only way, um, so, one other way where you can prevent p-hash collisions is by basically computing the chance that you always have at least one odd group over here. Every time you have a, an odd group of collisions, even when the uh, outputs all XOR together, you'll have at least one block cipher output resulting in a very unlikely um, collision. Okay, so then the approach there is that we take in the paper to try to analyze whether how likely these odd groups or even groups are to occur is uh, so let's say that these blocks over here, this is a set of all those blocks and it's some, it's some finite field. 
And uh, so you take the you take the message block, you take the constants, and you map them to a point in this uh, affine plane. You do that for all of them. And you basically, the only time that under a particular key, they all cancel each other out is if they are lying on the same slope. And you're trying to, an adversary is going to try and maximize the number of slopes on which they all lie on the same line. Anyway, so that was just briefly the intuition for why it's complicated. So again, PMAC message length dependence is non-trivial. There's a whole bunch of open problems left. What happens with the powering up? Uh, what are the optimal masks that you can use with PMAC? And also, we showed that yeah, if you have a collision in PHash, then you definitely have an attack in PMAC. And now, what about the opposite implication? Right? If you have an, a PRF attack against PMAC, um, what does that mean for the masks? In case, thank you for your attention. Thanks for the talk. We have still time for a question or two, if there are any. Any questions? There is one. So what, what is the exact bound you get for gray codes? You said it's non-trivial for gray codes. No, no, for, so for gray codes, we have, a, we have an actual attack. You can okay, find two messages which collide. No, uh, but you said message depends. So what is the problem? What is the bound? What is the bound? It's so the, the bound is if you have a message of length a power of two, then the bound is literally the, that power of two divided by two to the n. So if your message length is two to the k, then it's two to k over two to the n, roughly, with uh, ignoring some constants. Okay, so L over. Basically, yeah. Any other questions? If not, then let's thank Atul again. Thank you. Thanks.